to tell a little background story. If you all have heard my personal story, I apologize. But I've had just about every hormonal problem you can think of from um, very dysfunctional um, menstrual cycles, young, and then infertility, miscarriages, uh, hysterectomy, and weight gain as a result of that, being on Premarin, which is an unopposed estrogen, um, nearly 80 pounds. So, I mean, I didn't gain that weight, much weight with my pregnancy. So, I had a lot of things happen to me. And part of my journey was one day a woman said, can you write bioidentical hormones for me? And now granted, this is like after I had given up on Premarin because I gained a bunch of weight. And so I was like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> So it was interesting because I started reading, and what I read, oh, changed my life. and um, I got really mad when I read it because I was like, there is so much that people don't know, and if you get a chance to read it, it is the Bible that kind of started me on my path. And it starts a, a lot of people who do the bioidentical hormones on their path as well. If you get time, you can go to the... Um, you can do two bioidentical hormones. There's all sorts of people out there talking and that, that will share their journeys and their stories. And they don't teach you this in med school. They teach you pharmaceuticals. They teach you synthetic hormones and they teach you how to monitor levels for those. And they teach you that anything outside of that is basically malpractice. And so people are really scared and doctors are scared and they don't really know what to do with that. So to learn this stuff, you have to first be motivated. So hormonal problems are a big motivator. Weight gain is a big motivator. So I thank God that I had those opportunities. They didn't feel like opportunities at the time. But a lot of times, what are opportunities in our life? Things are happening for us, not to us. So be mindful of that as you're going through your struggles this week and next week and the week after that what seems really stressful to you in the moment is happening for you and not to you. And, you know, to speak to that too, cortisol is a hormone that is our stress hormone. And if you can get a handle on the way you handle situations, if you can just reframe it and, like I say, think of things as happening for you and not to you, really changes your cortisol levels. And part of the problem is I can replace or I can supplement your bioidentical hormones all day long, but if you choose to stay in a stressed out space where your cortisol is whacked out all the time, there's nothing I can do for you because your blood levels are going to change from minute to minute. And so there's nothing I can do for you. So the name of the game is to keep yourself balanced on your end so that my job is a whole lot easier. Because I can bring you in every six weeks and I can do blood work and it'll look completely different the next time. I think one of my gifts, and I thank God for it, is that um, having a, uh, you know, being on an autistic spectrum, I really see hormones as processes and I can look at the person I can see the whole body so it's not just one hormone in isolation it's not just estrogen or progesterone it's cortisol it's thyroid it's all the things that are happening in that person at the same time so it's really about looking at the big picture so you know if you've ever gone to a doctor who even was mindful enough to understand a little bit about bioidentical hormones if they weren't looking at the big picture if they weren't looking at your thyroid or they weren't looking at other aspects then they were missing the boat and so I'm really grateful that I have that vision to be able to see that and that I've been able to teach that in the process with our providers and, and what we do. So I want you to keep in mind that as you understand these hormones, they're being affected constantly by other hormones. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle when we're talking about hormones. Okay. Hormones 101, coming with college. Take biology one on one. Oh, please tell me this is going to work. So, what are hormones? Anybody know? Chemicals. Chemicals. What kind of chemicals? Neuro, like neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. We kind of think of them as messengers, so you can't really talk about hormones without talking about the nervous system because all of those hormones travel through the blood vessels, along the nerves, and, and do what they do throughout the nervous system. So you can see that if you have an excitable nervous system, your hormones are going to be traveling a lot faster. So again, if you're an anxious person or if you have hormones that have got you anxious, then that's going to be a problem. 
So everybody thinks when they think hormones, they think estrogen or testosterone, but there are over 50 hormones in the human body, and some people think with all the different hormone branches that there are over 250. So when we think of the word estrogen, everybody always thinks estrogen when they think hormones. When we think of the word estrogen, there are actually 15 different metabolites of estrogen. So estrogen is just kind of a blanket term. So we have all these different um, organs in the body, glands that make hormones. And we kind of start up here in the head with the pituitary gland and the pineal gland. Anybody know what this little pineal gland makes? It's called the third eye. And I'll give you a hint, you have to have a really dark room because it is directly related to the optic nerve. Sleep. Melatonin. That's what melatonin is made. So the pineal gland regulates melatonin, and melatonin regulates a lot of our other hormonal processes. The pituitary gland is mostly the feedback hormone of the brain, and that's where our hormone for thyroid comes from, and we're going to talk about thyroid, I think, week after next at some length. And that is called the TSH. Anybody ever heard of the TSH? TSH is a, is a feedback thyroid hormone. It's not even a thyroid hormone, but unfortunately, traditional medicine has taught us that the TSH is the gold standard for checking the thyroid, but it's really not, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about thyroid. And that leads us into the thyroid gland. And then and next to the thyroid gland are these little glands here called the parathyroids, and they do calcium metabolism and some other different <coughs> things, but the thyroid gland feeds back with the pituitary gland as, as do all these. On top of your kidneys on either side are these little glands called the adrenal glands. Anybody ever heard of those? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever heard of adrenal fatigue? Mm -hmm. That is a wiped out adrenal gland. They are all shriveled up and probably everybody in this room has like half their adrenal reserve that they should have. So again, how you deal with stress really speaks to how your adrenal glands are healthy or not healthy. And lots of vitamins, specific vitamins we'll talk about help keep your adrenal glands healthy, but it's so important to have healthy adrenal glands. People who have um, traumatic stress as, as a child or military people who've experienced really traumatic things especially are prone to adrenal fatigue. And if you can't make your stress and your cortisol, and I'm going to explain how cortisol um, comes into play here, if you can't do that, then it can really wipe that gland out. Also, if you lose your adrenal gland, or if you lose your ovaries, like you've had a hysterectomy, or through menopause, or men as their testes start to fail, the adrenal glands, this one little layer out here, can make all the same hormones as your ovaries can, which is very important to know, because that's why, have you ever heard anybody say, crotchety old women in their 80s say, I got your menopause, you're fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't need nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's because their adrenal glands, they had good reserve. So, you know, what I usually hear when people say things like that is they didn't have hot flashes. Because everybody thinks hot flashes is menopause. <laughs> but there's so many other symptoms. Sleep disorders, mood disorders, and weight gain are the biggest problems with perimenopause and menopause. And people just don't address that. I was at a party um, at our neighbors. It was like a church bonfire a week or so ago. And I was talking to this lady, I was kind of telling her, you know, what I do. And she said, yeah, I see my doctor, and I'm on synthetic thyroid hormone. And I'm thinking, hmm, there's her first problem. And um, this lady, I'm not going to say she was overweight, but I will say she's very under tall. <laughs> and she told me, yeah, my, th my thyroid's working fine. And I said, no, lady, your thyroid is not working. Fine. I don't know how your doctor has convinced you or the stories that we tell ourselves that everything's okay when it's clearly not. So um, I thought, you know, I, I wish, you know, that sometimes people would just think about what they're saying because um, thyroid controls your metabolism and if you're overweight, your thyroid is clearly not working. So um, as, they, as people go through menopause, just because they're not having hot flashes, if they're having sleep or mood or anything else, or the same thing with guys as their testosterone declines, those are all symptoms that you're not compensating and your adrenal glands are not compensating. And I don't like the term hormone replacement therapy. You all have heard that term. Mm -hmm. I like hormone supplementation therapy because without those hormones, you would simply die. Without estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, you'd be dead. So we're not replacing anything, we're just supplementing your deficient levels. 
Um, then that brings us down to the ovaries, which have follicles in it to produce all this stuff. Um, and then we have the testes in the men that make the testosterone. And then the pancreas also makes, you know what the pancreas makes? Insulin, you pretty good. So um, the pancreas also makes exocrine hormones, which are a digestive enzyme. So if your pancreas is not working or if you're diabetic, there's a good bet if it's not making endocrine hormones like insulin, it's not making exocrine hormones like your digestive enzymes. So um, that's a good, if you have diabetes, you should be on digestive enzymes. So we'll just kind of throw that in there. Oops. How do I go back? Sorry about that. I'm not used to this computer. Mm -hmm. So, biochem. Did anybody ever take biochem? Biochem gave me so much anxiety. He was memorizing all of this stuff ad nauseum. It was miserable. I was never so stressed out in my life. I think it was the only C I ever got, and I, I was grateful for the C because I really thought it was going to be an F. I, I've never flunked so many tests in all my life. And I was so stressed out. Had I known at the time, if I just trusted God that there was a vision in all this, and that someday I would be pivoting everything I do on this, I would have been like, okay, give it to me. But um, that was absolutely <laughs> miserable. My biochem teachers were crotchety, and they were hardcore, and it was chalkboards full of that over and over and over again. And like I say, I really wanted to understand, and I thought it had some implication for my future. I just didn't know what it was. So I just survived the best I could, and I memorized, memorized, memorized. But you look at these things, they're all just little houses and shapes and hydrogen and oxygen molecules, and some have double lines. And I swear, if you missed one double line on the test, you flunked. I mean, it was crazy. So you had to have it exactly right. And I didn't understand why I had to have it exactly right. I mean, what's the difference in one little line? But I'm telling you, <coughs> the difference in one little line can make the difference whether your progesterone helps promote your pregnancy, progestation, or kills your baby. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. That line matters. So when your doctor gives you a synthetic progesterone, if you give that to a pregnant woman, it can cause her to miscarry. If she gives you a natural, if a natural progesterone, it can promote the pregnancy and keep it going. So very important. This is also another important point. I'm going to show you a table here in a minute, how all these molecules work together. All of our hormones come from the cholesterol molecule. Enzymes change those over. So let's say you go to the doctor and you're having a health and wellness screening and they say, let's check your cholesterol. Does anybody ever have their cholesterol checked? Mm -hmm. And let's say your cholesterol, according to guidelines, high. What do they do? They do drugs. For your drugs. Usually a very expensive drug. <coughs> and so what does that drug do? Lowers your cholesterol. And it makes everybody happy. Well, my first problem with that is most people take drugs like that and they have no idea what their goal is in mind. So they have no idea what they're even trying to reduce or if they get to goal that they've even got to goal or what the number is that they're looking for. So that's my first beef is you all need to know your numbers. And if somebody's going to put you on a drug for something, know when to stop because those drugs have side effects. And they're dose-related side effects. So if the doctor keeps saying, you need more, you need more, you need more, you're just adding side effects on, and you don't even know what the goal is you're trying to get to to reach. So that's within your right to know that, to ask that, and to educate yourself about. So when I got out of med school, I wrote a book called Healthy Ambitions, Tools for Taking Charge of Your Health Care. And that's the premise was people being healthcare consumers, asking those questions, being entitled to their own information getting a copy of your lab results. You guys, every time, who, who's gotten lab results? Has anyone ever not got a copy? Okay, if you've had lab results done, you should have a copy and you should know what they mean. And if you don't, then you should keep asking until you find someone who can tell you what that means because it's never okay not to know. And if you've had lab work done at the past at other doctors, you have a right to that and you have a right to know what those numbers are. So. My first thing is, 
Now, cholesterol medication may have a certain role in certain people, and there's a great book called The Great Cholesterol Myth, which is very interesting. I don't want to make this all about cholesterol, but I think it's important that you understand that the studies bear out that people don't die of cholesterol. I'm standing here saying that, kind of like Columbus says the world was round and not flat. I also say the same thing that mammograms are bad, um, but there's lots of things that I say that you guys will probably hear and threaten to burn me at the stake for, but cholesterol is not bad. You need your cholesterol to make your hormones, but you need to make sure that your hormones are balanced so that you have the right distribution because there are certain molecules of cholesterol that can gum up the works, and so you want to make sure that you have the right ratios of those molecules. So I'm not saying that cholesterol can't be a problem, but I'm saying hormone balance is much more important because imbalance in your hormones causes inflammation, and it's the inflammation that will kill you, that will cause your heart attacks, your strokes, all the problems that may make the vessels more sticky so that cholesterol or calcium or anything else might stick there. So cholesterol is not the issue. They've done studies to show that 75% of people who have heart attacks and strokes have normal cholesterol levels, and it, the same is true vice versa. So cholesterol is the last thing that you need to be worrying about. Questions about molecules? So I want to explain how a hormone works in the body. So it's a, we decided it's a messenger, right? Everybody clear on that? So what happens is the hormone starts up here, and it finds inside the cell, this is the cell, this is the nucleus of the cell. Anybody take biology? You guys put me on the cell? Okay. And you have billions of cells in your body, and every cell is pretty much the same at this level. So it binds with a receptor, it looks like a little candy corn there. So this little candy corn complex goes into the nucleus of the cell, into the DNA. And I think it's very interesting, because people want to say, well, I'm overweight, because everybody in my family is overweight, so it must be genetic, right? <laughs> you do have certain genetics, that's true, but the way I like to think about this is, genetics are your factory, and factories make the proteins that dictate what happens in your body. So your factory is given to you by your family lineage and by God, and that doesn't change, but what your factory produces can change in a minute's notice. So whether you're a shirt factory or whether you're a peanut factory or you're anything else, that can change. So yes, you do have genetics for certain things, but you can change it. So when this complex goes into the DNA, all these little things are transcribed just like you would transcribe a letter or you know, take notes in an office or anything like that. And what comes out of that is all these little amino acids are walking down this chain and this hormone has triggered this chain to put these amino acids together to make a protein. You guys heard of protein? I'm always telling you, increase your protein. This protein then dictates what's made and it dictates whether your thyroid goes up or down, whether your cholesterol goes up or down, whether your digestion is increased or decreased. So every process in your body is dictated by the protein that's made from this DNA process. And every hormone works the same way. It may make different things, but every hormone works the same way. So whether it's estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, it doesn't matter. They all do this in the cell. With me so far? Mm -hmm. Questions? You guys are doing good. You're staying awake. I love it. I'm a little nervous about this. So I love this stuff. So I'm so grateful you guys are staying awake so far. Okay, so this is where it gets really interesting. Cholesterol. In the blue are little enzymes. Enzymes are little chemical messengers that change these things. So they put the oxygen and the hydrogen and the lines and the circles on there, and they have all the fun. So they're the little artists in the body, and they say, hey, cholesterol molecule, I want you to be a pregnenolone today. So they kick in and they do their thing. And those enzymes upregulate and downregulate depending on what your body needs, okay? So as pregnenolone comes over here, it changes into something called DHEA. Now keep in mind the interesting thing with bioidentical hormones is traditional hormones, they either give you estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone. Bioidentical hormones, we can give you DHEA, we can give you pregnenolone, we can talk progesterone, we can give you cortisol, we can give you estrogen, we can give you three different kinds of estrogen, testosterone, anything we want to give you. So lots of variability, individuality, and so one size does not fit all because not everybody needs the same thing. One thing I 
want to point out here is that progesterone can come over here and make your estrogens and testosterones, but progesterone can also go down here to cortisol. Now let's imagine that you are a stressed out little cat all the time and you're just freaking out and you're yelling and you're upset all the time and, and I hope my nurses aren't here because they're probably going, that's her. <laughs> but um, let's say you're that person and let's say you are constantly making cortisol to try to calm that down. Where do you think the body's going to pull its cortisol from? And where do you think progesterone is going to pull its base from? And what do you think you're not going to have left over in the process? So you see how important it is to have balance in all of this because if you're a stressed out little cat all the time, everything's getting shunted over there to cortisol, you're going to have a problem and you're not going to make all these hormones that you need. And like I showed you in the picture of the little candy corn going into the DNA, what proteins are made are upregulating or downregulating your metabolism, and that is strongly driven by estrogen and testosterone. Interestingly, like with men and women, you girls, have you ever tried to lose weight alongside a man? How'd that go for you? Not so bad. It's not fair. He did fine. <laughs> he did fine. It's not fair. cortisol just went. I know, right? <laughs> Guys, it's such an easier time because we are so complex down here. So um, that's just, you know, one of our differences that uh, testosterone really upregulates that metabolism so much easier. So. Questions about this before I move on? Oh, one thing I do want to show you is when we say estrogen, I'm talking about three different estrogen molecules mostly. And like I said, there are many, many kinds of estrogens. But and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in, in a minute, and I can come back to this slide. But I want you to look at the arrows because the arrows are very important. And I'm going to talk in terms of good, um, bad, and neutral estrogens. But this is what's known as bad estrogen, and I'm going to explain why here in just a little bit. This is the good estrogen, I mean, this is the neutral estrogen, and this is the good estrogen. If you look at the arrows, estradiol can go back and forth to the bad estrogen, okay? And estradiol, the neutral one, can go down to the good one. But if you look at the good one, the arrows only go one way. So, for those of you who are scared about breast cancer, I can give you estriol all day long and never have to worry about the bad estrogen. Let me explain a little bit more about that, but I want you to remember those arrows, because they only go one way. Okay. The cup was really on the ball that day. Not these, not always. <laughs> so again, I want to point out these are adrenal hormones. Remember I showed you the adrenal gland, that one little thin layer can make your progesterones, testosterones, and estrogens. They also make aldosterone, which regulates your salt and um, if you're thirsty a lot, it, you know, sometimes that can be because you're adrenal fatigued or exhausted because you don't have enough aldosterone because that regulates your salt and your potassium and thirst. Um, also, one way to tell if you're adrenally fatigued, well, a couple ways, um, is if your blood pressure is low. Because, you know, how many of y'all have, like, ever had low blood pressure and the doctor will tell you, oh, that's fine. No. It's not fine. That means your adrenals are not making enough to maintain your blood pressure, so that's not okay. Also, um, your pupils um, don't constrict well um, in, when you get in bright light, so that's another way you can tell. But um, Also, adrenaline, noradrenaline, that's your fight or flight hormones, that's your adrenaline, basically. So if you're always constantly in a state of anxiety and you're using up lots of adrenaline, that can really stress out the adrenal glands, too. You might know Tennessee Tuxedo. Yeah. men and testosterone just a minute, and I'm sure some of y'all have heard me talk about this. There was a guy over 40 years ago, very smart man, I guess, 
who did a study on 10 patients. Now let me just say, if I did a study on 10 patients and tried to make any kind of hypothesis from that, they would laugh me out of medicine. They'd be like, lady, who do you think you are? He won a Nobel Prize for that study. And his hypothesis, because one of his patients got prostate cancer during his testosterone study, that testosterone causes prostate cancer. But I want to ask you, and, and this has created a ton of negative energy for doctors for the last 40 years about giving men testosterone. They're scared to death. And they always check all these PSAs and you know they warn them and they're like, well, we can give you this if you absolutely have have to. If your testosterone, now the range for testosterone is usually 200 to 800. Most guys feel good about 900. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom of the range is 200. A doctor, if they see your range, if they check it, if they even think about it, probably would not treat you unless you're 100 or 150 because we don't want to cause prostate cancer. Okay, so there's that. I mean, they're terrified of this. Not to mention that bodybuilders for years used very large amounts of testosterone and shut down their testicles and then had liver problems which then caused all sorts of cancers which probably led to some prostate cancer. So there was a lot of misinformation that's happening in the meanwhile. But I just want to ask you to put on your thinking caps for one second. Who gets prostate cancer? Older men. Older men with decreased testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a teenage boy and let me just say, I saw this lady in the store one time, and she was buying like six loaves of bread, like six <coughs> gallons of milk. I mean, she looked like she was buying for a group home or something. And I said, wow, do you have like a group home or something? She's like, no, I have three teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> so that speaks to testosterone and hunger. So you have to watch that. Um, but have you ever seen a teenage boy with prostate cancer? Mm -hmm. They have the highest levels of testosterone. It just doesn't happen. And the same thing happens in women and estrogen. So I want you to look at these numbers. Yes, let's say estrogen did cause cancer. Your risk at age 25 of getting breast cancer is one in almost 20,000. So let me ask you, who gets breast cancer? When you think who usually gets breast cancer, who is it? Middle-aged older women. When their estrogen is the lowest, so again, like the testosterone, are you, are you following me? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. By the time you're age 85, when your estrogen is in the toilet, you have a one in nine chance. I mean, one in nine versus one in 20,000, that's huge. So, big difference. So, I just want to say that estrogen is not the problem, but there are some things that you do need to know about estrogen. which is the most protective form and pregnant women have very high levels of estriol you very rarely ever hear of a pregnant woman getting breast cancer and that's because her estriol levels are very high remember I showed you the arrows estriol only goes one way so even in women who had active breast cancer I can give them estriol all day long and treat their hot flashes help their mood changes you have choices so one of the main things that I hope to do to evangelize and empower people to know is that traditional medicine is not giving you all the information and not only but if you've had breast cancer or if you know someone who's had breast cancer educate them that they should know what these levels are because keeping this as high as possible and this as low as possible could save your life literally and nobody's telling you that. Also, just to mention, vitamin D can decrease your risk of breast cancer by 70%, 70%. Nobody's talking about that, but I mean, that's, that's huge. So, um, you know, there's just so much going on, but everybody wants to do mammograms and scare everybody. So, um, there's that. So, yeah, that's been many years. The cancer industry, that's been many years. 
Um, I don't think you should ever radiate a breast. Just I mentioned that before. There's lots of other tests you can do: ultrasounds, MRIs, thermography. It just does not make sense to radiate the breast. So. What's a normal amount of B? I usually recommend in the winter time about 10,000 international units a day of um, cholecalciferol, which is D3. And in the summer, you can probably get around 5,000 and be okay. And we can check a blood level for vitamin D if you want to see what they are. They're usually low in those people. Could you repeat that again, please? 5,000? 5,000 um, in the summer, 10,000 international units in the winter of D3. You want specifically D3? You said it has gotten a lot more popular in like home health patients that I see. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. You know, and in home health patients, it's very interesting yeah. because there are some relationships that not only um, it helps put the calcium in the bone, mm -hmm. so if they fall, they're less likely to break something, right. but also has been shown to increase balance, so they're less likely to fall. So if you have elderly folks, D3 is very important. D3 is actually um, a hormone. We don't really think of, um, you know, vitamin D as a hormone, but really, I didn't Isn't vitamin D one of the ones that you can... It is. A, D, E, and K are what we call fat soluble. They can build up in the fat, so you can't get too much of them. Uh, what was that statement that you made about have have this one the lowest and this one the highest? You want estrone, yeah. which is the ugly one, as low as possible. And you want estriol, the good one, the breast protective one, as high as possible. The neutral one, we still use this a bit. And there are some folks out there doing bioidentical hormones, which I don't agree with this, who actually do what they call triest, which is all three estrogens. I never do that. If you ever see that on my scripts, that's an accident. Um, I, I never use E1 just because I, I don't think there's ever any reason to use that. Um, there's another thing you'll see on scripts sometimes called biased, and it's these two. Mm -hmm. This is a weaker estrogen, so it's not going to help a whole lot with hot flashes. So if you have a woman who has hot flashes, if she's had active breast cancer, even yet, sometimes I still add a little bit of estri estradiol, but I'll educate her that that arrow does go back and forth. So you can manipulate, I hate to use the word manipulate, but you can control those enzyme levels of whether it goes back and forth with certain supplements. One of those supplements is something called DIM, diethylmendolamine, and that's in your handout. It's found in green leafy cruciferous vegetables, so if you eat lots of veggies, you got it covered, but you can actually take that as a supplement. And I have some women who are um, who have had breast cancer, that I give them E3 and a little bit of E2, but I make sure they're on the DIM. I give the guys DIM sometimes because it blocks um, their estrogen as well, so it's a, a, a bad estrogen as well, so I'll use it in guys sometimes too. So but why does the body have the estrogen then? It does have some functions, and it does help bone density, and it does have to help with cardiovascular health. So I shouldn't say it's ugly, but I didn't make anything ugly. It's the ratio and the unbalance. Part of the problem with soy is soy is more akin chemically to the ugly one. So you have to watch your soy intake. Soy can <coughs> help with menopausal symptoms, but too much soy can cause your um, bad estrogens basically to be unbalanced. And part of the problem is, and if you look in your handout, there's a little section in there. I don't know what page it is. Um, but it's, it looks like double columns. And the science is a little bit tricky to understand, and even with my background, I, I kind of struggle with it a little bit. But you have basically three different kinds of receptors, alpha, beta, and I think it's gamma receptors. And those, those also are good, bad, and ugly receptors. And so this, the, the bad receptors are upregulated when you have a lot of bad estrogen. So the name of the game is to keep the good estrogen as high as possible so you upregulate the good receptors. So it goes one step deeper even than having your estrogen balance, but it's to have those receptors balanced, and those are balanced and upregulated and downregulated based on having your good levels, right? Is that confusing? Guys following me? Some people didn't get handouts and are asked about it. Can, if y'all just see me after, I'll email them. Yeah, if y'all could just share for a minute, and then we'll make sure you get them before we go. Yeah, just be sure to get with me afterward. Also, when we talk about the ugly, too much estrogen, you guys will hear terminology, and in Dr. Lee's book, um, he talks a lot about estrogen dominance. And estrogen is stored in adipose tissue or fat cells. And so the, it's sort of like the more fat you have, the more estrogen you store, the more fat you have, the more estrogen you store. 
And with guys, testosterone, if you looked at those arrows when I showed you that graph from cholesterol down to estrogen, testosterone can convert back to estrogen. And that's why it's so important to check estrogen levels along with guys' testosterone levels, because we want to have healthy testosterone levels and lower estrogen. But guys do need estrogen for bone density, and guys can have hot flashes too. So mood changes, all sorts of things. So they need a healthy level of estrogen, but the ratio is just different from men to women. So um, guys have a lot lower estrogen levels. So having too much estrogen, and especially too much bad estrogen, can increase the inflammation in your system, strokes, heart disease, increased body fat, enlarged prostates. Oh, and another interesting thing I will talk about, um, the study since with men and testosterone. One of the things they found in a subsequent study was that if they did orchiectomy, which is removing the testicles, which is castration, men with prostate cancer got better. And so part of what came out of that was, oh, they removed the testes, they removed the testosterone. That must be why they got better from their prostate cancer. But subsequent studies, even on that one, that they followed it back up, what they removed was the estrogen. And so they never really talked about that. So actually castration removes all the hormones that were potentially unbalancing things. So bad estrogen can also increase a man's risk of prostate cancer. So just a little bit of dysfunctional science, if you will, but I mean, we're on the back end of that now. If you Google testosterone and prostate cancer, there's plenty of stuff out there. So I, I implore you not to just believe me. Look it up yourself if you, know, if you have any doubts with that. Muscle tone is the big thing. With too much estrogen, you lose muscle tone. With too much estrogen, you have an imbalance in cortisol, and cortisol causes that shift from, you know, when you were younger and you gained a little weight, you gained it in your legs or your thighs or your arms, and now it all kind of shifts up here into the midsection. That's what excess estrogen and excess cortisol does for you. So um, when you see that distribution, I can look at a woman in menopausal or after hysterectomy who's got this distribution. We call it the, they call it the pear shape. And every time, you know, that's um, that's that distribution. Have you ever heard that a woman, if she has a boy child or a female child when she's pregnant, that she'll have bigger hips or, you know, different distribution or a bigger belly? That's because testosterone or estrogen influence of the baby. So um, there is some truth to that. The period lower um, yeah, well, yeah, to, well, estrogen usually makes you gain more in the hips and kind of the belly area. So, yeah, if it's a female, it'll be a little bit more hippy. And we all know what menopausal symptoms get. <laughs> 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 you pay attention, Pete. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit why everyone got scared, just like with that study 40 years ago, the man with 10 testosterone patients. In 2002, there was a landmark study called the Women's Health Initiative, and this is what scared the pants off of all the doctors and tried to scare all the patients. Now, interestingly, this big scare, and when they started pulling women off all their hormones, they found something else to substitute. So the women were coming in depressed and anxious, so you know what they gave them instead? So their presence and anti-anxiety meds, that is a multi-billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. So when a woman has that, she doesn't have a Prozac deficiency. <laughs> she has a hormone imbalance. <laughs> she's not been completely psychotic her whole life, and all of a sudden she is. She does not have a Prozac deficiency. Just like when you have a headache, you don't have an aspirin deficiency. So what they found was conventional hormone replacement therapy they were using synthetic hormones, okay? So I want to just point that out first. And they were using synthetic hormones by male. How am I doing on time? Almost okay. Okay. So they were using conventional hormone replacement therapy. So they used Premarin, Prim Pro, Prim, the Prim Estrogen Plus <coughs> Progesterone. Um, and it was beautiful. And I'm going to talk about why that's bad in a minute. Um, but I also want to say that Women receiving conjugated equine or horse drive, primary comes from pregnant mare mm -hmm. urine. Um, there is something about that estrogen molecule. It's just a little hydrogen or oxygen, but it's enough that it's carcinogenic in humans. So they had an increased, six fold increased risk for uterine cancer when they were taking that. So there's lots of reasons for that. Also, if you give a woman estrogen who still has a uterus, estrogen for the first part of the cycle causes you to build up your uterine lining. 
And then if you don't, if you ovulate or you don't get pregnant, then you slough off that lining and progesterone drives that. So what happens is a woman who gets estrogen, 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 but doesn't get enough progesterone has an increased risk of uterine cancer because all that lining is just building up in there, getting stagnant and funky and stale, and then that kind of turns into cancer. Same thing with a woman who has estrogen dominance. So if you're overweight and you have estrogen dominance, not only are you at risk for cardiovascular disease and inflammatory chronic illness, but uterine cancer because all that estrogen is just building up that lining, building up that lining. And women who are overweight who don't have menstrual cycles because they don't have enough progesterone to slough that off <coughs> are also at risk for uterine cancer. So nobody's really talking about that. More than 160,000 women participated in this study. Now I can get on board with that kind of study. Can you guys <laughs> give me 160,000 patients instead of 10? And I'll believe you. But what they found was a 26% increased risk of breast cancer, 29% increased risk of heart attack, and 41% increase in stroke and blood clots. And because of this breast thing, they stopped the study. They said, Ooh, we're done. We're, you know, it's dangerous. So, and they made their conclusions at that point. Now, there have been plenty of more than 200 follow up studies to this WHI study who have dissected all of the things that they didn't talk about in this study because they just got scared and shut down which is kind of common, we all get scared and just shut down. Um, but they negated all those effects and they've talked about why, but nobody's talking about all that. They're still talking about this study done in 2002 and it's still scaring everybody, so. So, but did they then say, okay, we've got to do something more? Well, yeah, the people who are getting on board with the um, bioidentical hormones and that stuff are saying, yeah, we got to do something else, but traditional doctors are just saying, let me just give you an antidepressant because estrogen's not safe. They, they just haven't bothered to get on board with the education and understand. And they're talking, this study uh, is based on synthetic hormones? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about synthetic hormones, like I mentioned with progesterone, you can change a molecule, add another line, change an oxygen or hydrogen, and you can patent it. And the beauty of a patent is you can make a lot of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't patent a hormone because God's got the patent on those. <laughs> but like I said, the change between a progesterone and a progestin, which is if the synthetic molecule is enough to make you abort a baby versus support or carry a baby. So, um, guys, uh, bear with me just a minute, but I want to just talk about the female cycle. And again, that was the first part of the cycle is estrogen, the second part of the cycle is progesterone. And women who are menstruating, and some of you may still be menstruating a little bit, it's very important that if you don't have enough progesterone to support ovulation, ovulations that popping out of that egg basically that would cause you to get pregnant, but ovulation also sends a feedback cascade to the brain to start the process all over again. And we are very cyclical nature people. And men are cyclical in nature too. And if you've ever wondered that, you can like Michelle mentioned, keep a mood calendar on your men, and you can track it every month when they're having their cycle. So it's the same thing in men, but it's very pronounced in women. So what I normally do is give women a little progesterone in the first week before their period, and it really calms down that estrogen peak, helps with migraines, helps with fibroids, helps with estrogen dominance and symptoms and all sorts of things. So it's really important to kind of understand that. So again, this is just what I was saying. This is a natural human progesterone molecule. This is a synthetic hydroxy progesterone acetate, and you can see it's very different. So I have a lot of reservations about birth control pills because all birth control pills are synthetic hormones. Mm -hmm. And so you have to wonder why we have had increases in breast cancer over the last 10 years, you know, 20 years, however long even birth control has been out. You have to wonder why we're seeing you know, changes in more women needing hysterectomies and having fibroids and all sorts of issues happening. Um, you know, I don't know early on taking synthetic hormones what sort of impact that has on us. Um, I do occasionally, you know, support a young female taking birth control because a lot of times they're just not motivated enough to use the natural progesterone. You have to cycle it and you have to use the rhythm method, which is not having intercourse during ovulation. Um, and so, you know, sometimes the risk outweighs the benefit of that. Um, I, I like IUDs, I like copper IUDs. A lot of the IUDs secrete hormone, and I don't like those because they're synthetic hormone. 
Um, so birth control is a tricky issue when you're trying to avoid pregnancy. Um, so I like my families to be really educated about this because I don't want to raise baby. <laughs> so, you know, if we're going to do it natural or I have a young girl who just can't take birth control pills or histories of clots and that sort of thing and they have increased risk, um, I really try to get them to use the natural progesterone and educate them how to do it properly. So why creams or shots? We really push a lot of that. Not only the creams, because you can go to a compounding pharmacist and they can mix it the way we want. If you're still having periods, usually it's just progesterone, um, but it's cycled. If you don't have periods anymore, we can do estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, for libido, all sorts of things. But the reason for the cream is because when you take a pill by mouth, it goes through the liver. We call that first pass metabolism. And <coughs> inflammatory proteins are made during that process. And we learned that the hard way with bodybuilders who are taking testosterone by mouth, they fried their livers. So anytime you can avoid taking a sex steroid hormone by mouth, um, that is really the safest route. And when you take a cream, it goes straight into the bloodstream. Um, also, that WHI study was done not only on synthetic hormones, but they were done on the oral form by mouth. So. Um, again, you know, when that goes through the liver, inflammation, all sorts of things come into play. So um, during that first study, those were things they just didn't consider. And shots, of course, are the same way. We also do pellets. I don't know if y'all are aware of those. Y'all ever heard of pellets? Mm -hmm. Pellets are interesting. You make a, you numb up the skin and you put these little things that look like Tic Tacs. They're compounded bioidentical hormone and they last up to five months. So if you don't like shots or you don't like using the cream every day, that's always an option. It's not a cheap option, but, um, but it is an option. So who's ever wondered about saliva tests? Why do we do saliva tests? I personally like saliva tests because when I do that, they have like this little hand, at this little thing that you fill out that asks you all these questions. And so it's kind of like another layer of asking you what's going on with you, but they also give me a really nice interpretation or a printout of what, these, what the doctors there at the ZRT lab think is going on with you. So, um, and this just happened, I think it was like a month, a month and a half ago. Um, I was so out of balance. I don't know if I was stressed or what was happening, but I checked my blood and it just really didn't seem to be helping me understand what was going on. It was all over the place and I was like, I'm just going to do a saliva test. It's a miserable experience, I have to tell you, because you got to like spit in this little tube and it takes like an hour to get that much spit in the tube. So you have to do it and think about how hard it is to make spit. <laughs> but um, so I sent it in and it, it was all whacked out. I mean, my testosterone was high, and I'm like, am I getting that from my husband, or what's going on? I just, I don't know, I always act me and stuff, but anyway, so I, I got more progesterone on board, and I'm fine now, but sometimes when I get really stuck, it's like having a second opinion, getting a saliva. Um, there's also this theory that saliva is a picture over time what's happening, and blood levels can change from minute to minute. That's why we check you first thing in the morning. We like to check you fast. <coughs> so all sorts of different variables come into play, but with the saliva, it's sort of a picture over time. Also with the saliva, we can do cortisol levels, so not just cortisol levels in the morning, but you can do serial cortisol levels through the day to see how wiped out your adrenal glands really are. Seven dwarves of menopause. Itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloody, grateful, <laughs> and psycho. <laughs> and psycho more than once. <laughs> so these are some of my favorite references. Of course, my book. And Dr. John Lee again. I, he writes it really simple. I hope that I wrote my book simply too. Dr. John Lee talks in really lay language. He's no longer living, but he's got a team that still continue to write books. He's got one called, you can fill in the blank here, what your doctor may not tell you about, and then you can put just about any title here, but his title, Breast Cancer, is a must read for anybody who has an increased family history or who's ever had um, breast cancer. It's just, he talks about all the different estrogens and supplements. Um, very interesting, not only vitamin D, but iodine, and having a healthy thyroid. The women in Japan, at least before the tsunami, who have healthy iodine levels, have almost no fibrocystic breast disease and no breast cancer. They have almost no <coughs> thyroid disease and thyroid cancer. So iodine is really important for breast health as well. Suzanne Summers, love her. I'm going. Um, 
next month actually to um, a conference she's going to be at. So I'm really excited. To, it'll be the first time I've actually heard her live. I think she's just a real dynamic person. You know, she's the first to say she's not a doctor, but she's really working hard to empower women to get the word out about all this stuff. So I would commission you all to go out and tell three people that estrogen does not cause breast cancer and you do have choices. Um, so that kind of makes me feel better about what I've done here tonight. Um, and then Dr. Jonathan Wright, he's a real visionary with bioidentical hormones as well. And when I look at some of, and I'm, I'm not knocking local doctors, anybody who's trying to do bioidentical hormones, I really kudos to them for doing that. But what I see when I see their prescriptions is they're not following what Dr. John Lee or Dr. Wright really propose. So, I mean, you'll see things all over the place. For instance, sometimes I'll see scripts come across me, or I'll see um, people's prior prescriptions, and they'll have like 200 milligrams of progesterone. We very rarely ever use over 30 milligrams of progesterone because you can have weight gain, and you can have all sorts of mood disturbances and fluid build up and all sorts of things with that. So you really have to be educated and I may not always be here to manage your hormones, so it's really important that you understand um, how, how all this works. And in your handout are some actual prescriptions of the way things look. So get familiar with that um, and ask me or ask Emily or one of the providers. Um, so I think it's really important that you are able to read your own prescriptions and know what you're getting and know what your target levels are, know what your blood levels are you're trying to achieve and where you're going. And um, I've got a little handout on lab values and stuff that, that we will do at some point before the 12 weeks is up and talk specifically about how to look at your lab values and, and what to shoot for and that sort of thing. So I think that's really important that you know your bodies. Most people know more about their cores <laughs> than they know about their own bodies. So. I think this is um, really important. I hope you do too. Okay. Questions, thoughts? When you mentioned a while ago, like when you were talking about the saliva test, <coughs> and you said like you could do the cortisol, mm -hmm. and then your is that an indication that your adrenal glands are wiped out? The cortisol? If it's low, yeah, if it's wiped, you used up. Sometimes people have elevated cortisol levels before it'll actually completely give out. So that's an indicator too if your cortisol levels are high, but usually people that have adrenal fatigue. So you can have like, I mean like spikes, like it's. Yeah, cortisol spikes about four times during the day. And cortisol spikes every time you eat. And if you eat something on your food allergy list, it spikes over 12 times normal. Oh, wow. So that's why we do the food sensitivity test. And all you guys in the contest should be getting those back pretty soon. Everybody else have their food allergies back. And if it yeah. dips, if it goes down, what does that indicate? Well, it normally after it spikes, it'll go back down to baseline, but when you have adrenal fatigue, it usually like if it just goes stays down to baseline. Down. Yeah, usually that just means it's just over over excreting, kind of like the pancreas can over excrete insulin and then insulin becomes resistant. Cortisol can kind of do the same thing as well. So it's important. That's why it's kind of nice to see those serial cortisol levels through the day because we can kind of see, well, it went up around noon, <laughs> way up, and then it went down, and then we can say, well, what were you doing that day that, you know, maybe there was something triggering it to go a certain way, or maybe it wasn't responding at all, maybe it just stayed really low all day long, or maybe it stayed really high all day long. So it's just a, a, a bigger picture. Okay, how do you know if our thyroid is, if we're on thyroid, what's the right level for us? Um, if you're an ideal body weight and you feel good and your free T3 is at the, I usually push it to the top of the range, I'd say that's a good range and you're good. If you're still overweight, I think we still probably need to keep pushing that thyroid. Um, some of my providers, my APNs, have been a little nervous about pushing the thyroid. I am not. So I will be the first one to tell you guys, if you're not feeling good, you're not losing weight, you're not there, double up on the thyroid you're taking now. Let, you know, let us know that, that you've done that. And if you're still not feeling better, not getting where you need to go, then we need to check other hormones and see why, because if you're you know, not losing weight at the rate that you think you should be, you're getting your metabolism back. Granted, if you're doing all the right things, you're trying to avoid your food allergies and your exercise and all that. So you have to look at the big picture there. And what's that time frame you think that you should start feeling really good or start increasing it if you're not? The 
recovery kicks in usually within a week or two. So I'd say 10 to 20 days is when you should start thinking, maybe I need to bump it up a little bit. Those armor thyroids are tiny, um, so they're hard to cut, but usually I'll try just taking an extra half in the afternoon. And that's a good trick if you're tired in the afternoon, take another thyroid in the afternoon. Really? That usually what are you talking about? The things that you're taking after you know your food allergies? Or um, if, if your T3 was low, the nurse practitioner would probably put you on an armor thyroid. Okay. Did you see what you're talking about? Oh, okay. Okay. Back. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So this will make a lot more sense to you when, when you get all that. So, back. okay. Are there side effects to too much thyroid? Too much thyroid? Yeah. Um, thyroid increases your metabolism. So if your thyroid is sluggish, then you'll gain weight and you'll have constipation and you'll be tired. So just the opposite is true. If you get too much, you'll be anxious, maybe diarrhea, you know, maybe um, heart palpitations a little bit. So. Um, within the ranges that we use here for a subclinical hypothyroidism, you really don't have to worry about that. But occasionally we'll have somebody real sensitive. And then again, we're going to talk about all this when we talk about thyroid week after next. But um, sometimes we have to use a specific form of thyroid called T3, which is the active thyroid hormone. And that works kind of like the spark plug. So if you're, you know how a spark plug works in the car mm -hmm. or the pilot light, if that's out, <laughs> T3 works really well to upregulate that in the DNA. So. That's one of our little tricks that we do sometimes. So how should you increase your thyroid? Usually by half a tablet, adding a half a tablet on. In the afternoon? In the afternoon is good. Do that for you know, 10, 20 days and see how you feel. And then you go a whole tablet twice a day. Um, before you go three tablets in a day, you might check in or maybe do some blood work and see where you're at. Yeah, because you know, they're not going to have Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, they'll be calling anyway. But um, usually 100 milligrams is where I try to make the cutoff that you can increase it on your own. <coughs> yeah, I'd be like afraid to do it without right? so, yeah. Yeah, like that. yeah, you can always call us or email and say, I'm going to go up a little bit more. How do you think? Yeah. Can you address Solway a little bit? I mean, I've read just real quickly a few things in here and then I heard you talking about it. But, you know, that's a big deal. The soy, and I haven't quite... <coughs> grasped if it's a, a good one or if it's good or bad? Well, let me just back up a moment and say plants. I mean, we get our estrogens that are um, distilled out from the sweet potato plant. So we get our bioidentical hormones, which are bioidentical meaning same as the, the structure in humans, from plants. So plant hormone is not necessarily bad, but the problem with the um, phytoestrogen in soy is that it's similar to estrone, which is the bad estrogen. Okay. So you have to watch that because, you know, God gave us estrone for a reason. It has certain, certain you know, reasons to be in the body, but too much of it can change that balance a little bit. Then there's also the thing about genetically modified soy, which I have no idea if that's good or bad. I've, I've heard all sorts of maybe propaganda that genetically modified is bad. I don't know that it's all that bad, but um, it scares me a little bit because it's just different. Um, and they, you know, I've seen plenty of um, studies that show that it, it can cause problems. Um, also, pesticides and plastics, there's like, uh, I think it's called PVCs and plastic, mm -hmm. have estrogen-like properties to them. The molecules are very similar. We call this xenoestrogens, and they can cause all sorts of problems. And I think that's part of the reason, and plus they're putting estrogens in the milk and the food mm -hmm. supply to make the chickens and the meat fat. So I think that's probably part of the reason why we're seeing more obesity and we're seeing more um, precocious puberty, meaning girls starting their period sooner mm -hmm. and um, you know, pesticides. So if you can get grass-fed beef, if you can get organic meat, organic fruits and vegetables, I don't want to make you paranoid, but that's really the ideal situation if you wanted to keep your body as healthy and inflammation, and chronic disease, cancer-free, anti-aging, all well, that's really important. <coughs> so what I do is take a bunch of vitamins <laughs> Because I know I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I try to eat pretty clean and pretty healthy. I juice. Does anybody juice? Juicing is awesome. There's a great video called Fat Sick and Nearly Dead. Have you guys seen that? I'm not an avid juicer like that, but I don't eat a lot of green leafy vegetables. So at least juicing gets me my, you know, five or six a day for sure. But it sounds great. Did you get his juicer? 
No, I, I use the um, Jackal Elaine from Walmart. It's $99, and it works really, really well. I personally think that smoothies are probably better as long as you don't put a lot of sugar in them because I think the whole vegetable is probably better, but there's a lot of good properties from the juicing. Because his had a lot of pulp. Yeah. But what I Mine has do pulp. is I turn that into a smoothie. That's a great idea. So I didn't go mm -hmm. And you can put it in like if you're making muffins mm -hmm. or breads. Oh, great. Yeah, like yeah. the vegetable bread. If you can have I like mine because it's so <laughs> quiet because some juicers are really, really noisy. <coughs> All right, well, I know you guys probably have things to do, so I'm going to hang around if you have specific questions. But otherwise, thank you, guys. My email is drchammy at projectfabulous.com. If you have specific questions and don't have time to ask me tonight, please shoot me an email this week. I check it a couple of times a day. I'm kind of obsessive about that. So, and I don't mind at all. I have one, I want to hear your feedback. I want to help you any way I can. So, you reach out.